If you're in a relationship with an Enneagram type one, then you should know that their ego is constantly telling them that a good life is earned by being a good person. But what does it mean to be a good person? Well, it usually starts with a strict sense of morality and some incredibly high standards for just about everything they do in life. But on a deeper level, ones just feel responsible to improve the world around them, which is why they're called the reformer. It's much more nuanced than just being some nitpicky perfectionist, so you can go ahead and throw that superficial label right out the window. Okay, with that said, my five key themes for relationships with Enneagram ones are all about their good behavior, criticism, anger, productivity, and pleasure. If that already sounds like the person you're in a relationship with, then buckle up, because we're just scratching the surface of the Type 1's rigid yet endearing surface. Enneagram 1's always want to look well-behaved. Typically that means being clean, being on time, being humble about their success, being financially responsible, and of course, prudent about all things sexual. Ones are compliant types within the Hornevian triad, so generally speaking, they treat every social situation, including their home, as a time to follow the rules of whoever's in charge. That's not to say ones can't be rebellious, it just means that if they are, then they must believe their rules are better than the rules of whoever is supposedly in charge. Now, if their partner disagrees with their behavior, things can get a little dicey because ones pride themselves on being hyper vigilant about the morality of all their actions. You may just want an apology for something really small, but it tends to come across like a major indictment to the one's ego that's telling them that being wrong or causing embarrassment will ultimately lead to getting severely punished or worse, being rejected by the ones they love most. Since childhood, ones were made to believe that good behavior doesn't necessarily merit a reward, but bad behavior will most certainly be punished. This is why ones are so hard on their romantic partners, because they expect to be punished for anything their partner does wrong, as well as anything they do wrong. Ones are deeply committed people because commitment feels like a virtue, which is great for their partners right up until they feel the weight of this moral burden pressing up against their loving commitment. All that to say, if you as a one's partner aren't living up to their high moral standards for good behavior, you're gonna hear about it early and often. That is, of course, unless you found a very healthy one that's learned to silence the self-critical chatter of that pesky superego. All right, it's a pretty good segue to our next theme, which is criticism is a love language. Ones are critical people at their core. They just can't help it. But they criticize because they care, and it's perhaps the hardest thing about being in a relationship with Enneagram Ones because it requires such a strong sense of self to endure and embrace the One's ever-critical eye. The good thing is, you never have to wonder where you stand with a One. In a relationship, there's almost no such thing as flattery, and words of affirmation are typically saved for truly important moments. For Ones, their word is their life, and their life is all about integrity. Ones believe it's their duty to use their powers of discernment for good, and they can either be skilled surgeons cutting away precisely at a tumor, or a one-man demolition team taking a sledgehammer to your most sensitive wounds. Ones hope that their constant criticism is a sign of just how committed they are to a person, because they know it requires a safe, intimate space to expose such powerful and often painful observations. Ironically, ones are incredibly sensitive to receiving their partner's criticism. The problem is that ones are just so damn hard on themselves that they leave almost no room for anyone else to be even slightly tough on them. So if you're gonna be critical of a one, I would just recommend doing the old compliment sandwich, you know, where you do like compliment, critique, compliment. That way you can hopefully avoid getting hit with a sudden abrasive wave of justification or worse, their total grievance recall, which is this unique ability to remember everything you've ever done wrong because they've been rehearsing it for just this very moment in order to defend themselves from any unexpected or unfair punishment. Ones are pretty obsessed with things feeling fair, so when things don't go their way, they get really upset. And that's a good segue to our next theme, which is all about anger. It's important to remember that anger isn't inherently bad. It's natural, and it's what happens when something we love gets taken away from us. But for ones, they feel like their anger is wrong, or at least it's gonna get them in trouble. So they fight hard to suppress it in order to look well-behaved, see theme number one. However, this just creates a ton of physical tension in the body because they're constantly fighting to keep a lid on this simmering pool of rage. In romantic relationships, the one's partner will need to become a solid anger interpreter because anger or that physical rigidity is gonna be your first sign of a deeper disappointment or buried emotion of some kind. Ones 
typically weren't allowed to express a lot of negative emotions as a child, which makes them look a bit stoic on the surface as adults, despite being pretty emotional people. Most of the time, ones cover up heavy emotions like grief or sorrow or shame with their anger. That's because sorrow and shame just feel weak, but anger makes ones feel clear and confident and justified in their actions. Average or unhealthy ones can even start relying on their angry outbursts as a way of relieving the physical tension produced by all their unprocessed grief. Sometimes these angry outbursts can be a real chance for honesty and intimacy though, so don't be too scared of them. Lastly, a common red flag for ones in a relationship isn't their anger, but their total silence. Ones go silent for a few reasons, to uh, wallow in self-pity, to plan their counter argument, or to enact their scorched earth policy, uh, which entails burning every bridge with someone they have no intention of forgiving. That starts to get into the ones movement to the type four individualist and disintegration, but if you wanna learn more about that, just be sure to watch my complete guide to Enneagram ones linked in the description below. Okay. It turns out that anger isn't the only thing ones use to hide their heavy emotions, as their preferred tactic is actually to get super productive, which leads us to our next theme. Average ones have a very restless mind. This gets into the theory of the triad centers, which I have a video about linked in the description if you haven't heard of those before. But the short version of it is that this mental restlessness works its way down through the heart and out through the body and manifests itself as some compulsive productivity. Productivity is also a subtle way of controlling their environment, which then makes them feel safe. This also makes ones very protective of their time, which they just never seem to have enough of. So if you ask your type one partner to do something around the house or to go to an event that they hadn't planned on attending, they're probably gonna resist you because A, they've already filled up their own to-do list, and B, if they thought it was important, they would have either done it already or put it on the schedule. Ones love a concrete list of chores or a shared calendar of important events. So if you wanna avoid some needless arguments, there's your solution. Furthermore, ones, and especially ones with a self-preservation instinct, tend to dive into physical activities or household projects to numb their anxiety about a lack of certainty about certain complex decisions or painful situations like a death or divorce. Ones always wanna make the perfect decision, but so many things in life have no perfect option. And so they'll avoid making any decision by focusing on easier tasks or mindless routines. Okay, last small thing to note here is that ones also see productivity as a moral virtue. So too much free time can actually start to feel like a bad or wasteful thing. This gets pretty difficult in a relationship if their partner works hard all week and then just wants to spend the weekend lounging around on the couch. The one often feels like, hey, Saturdays are for cleaning or Sundays are about prepping for Monday. But all that hustle and bustle actually ties into our next theme, which is the one's hesitant embrace of pleasure. Ones love a good reward system. You work hard, you do the right thing, and then you get a treat. If you don't work hard and you goof off and you ignore your responsibilities, then you will and should be punished. That all seems fair to a type one. The problem is they set the bar incredibly high for what deserves a reward and super low for what deserves a punishment. It's like 90-10 in favor of punishments. In relationships, this makes them very hesitant to go on vacation, do self-care, go out for drinks, watch TV on a Saturday morning, play some video games, or especially have sex, as all of those things can be tinged with judgment as they're not inherently noble or virtuous activities. It's not to say that they're bad or sinful things, it's just that they feel like they're in the reward column and you better have done plenty of good, responsible, or even selfless things before you started enjoying all that fun stuff. The simplest way to say it, is that guilt follows pleasure. This makes it super difficult for ones to just ask for what they want, and instead they hope their partner will intuit their deep desires or physical needs. But that's almost always an impossible task because ones have worked so hard to look self-reliant that their partners often assume they don't need anything. The sign of a healthy, happy one is actually when they've accepted pleasure as a necessary part of life, and they start taking their playtime as seriously as they take their work time, which is why they go to the type seven enthusiast during integration. Again. Watch my complete guide to Enneagram Ones if you wanna learn more about all those theories. Okay, that was the last major theme for type one relationships. Time to wrap things up with one brief bonus topic, which is about the type one's love language. In case you need a refresher, the five love languages are acts of service, quality time, gifts, physical touch, and words of affirmation. Now this is by no means the same for all ones, but in general, I would say their preferred love language is either quality time or acts of service. 
Ones want to perfect their relationship, and you can't do that without real quality time together. They also don't like to ask for what they need, but they really appreciate it when you help out, so going out of your way to serve them will likely foster some deep appreciation. They also tend to be pretty sparing with words of affirmation and physical touch, which then leaves gifts somewhere around the middle of the pack because Ones don't necessarily want to be seen as materialistic, although they probably appreciate feeling seen by someone that can buy them a super specific or useful gift. But hey, if you're a one, let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with that assessment. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on this overview of the type one's general relationship themes. I've got relationship overviews coming for the other eight Enneagram types next, so be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of the good stuff as it comes out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you again on You've Got a Type.